All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, time to begin. Uh, it's one o'clock, and so we will begin uh, having a discussion about uh, the economics of prosperity uh, or economic progress or economic expansion development. And that's what uh, I'm going to be speaking on uh, today. Uh, the topic, economic progress, is uh, we could say one of the main topics of uh, macroeconomics. Uh, Austrian economics uh, does not uh, view macroeconomics as a separate uh, set of theories that are somehow mysteriously unrelated and disconnected from so-called microeconomics. Um, we view micro and macroeconomics as uh, more, more topical. We see all of economics as related. Uh, and so uh, all of what we call microeconomics, a price theory, uh, how prices are determined, what causes prices to change, how do people react to price changes, those, those micro-oriented topics are uh, all implications of the general principles of human action, mainly the law of marginal utility and the law of returns. Macroeconomics uh, applies those same economic principles, but to different topics. And the topics, uh, there's three broad topics of um, uh, macroeconomics in the Austrian perspective. Uh, there's the topic of the, purchase, the purchasing power of money. What determines the purchasing power of money, or what Mises calls the objective exchange value of money? And then there is the topic of business cycles and recessions, or what uh, can cause a, a, an economy to become discoordinated so that there is a cyclical downturn. And then the third topic um, that we're going to talk about today is economic expansion development. What uh, happens, what can happen that will allow for uh, uh, an expansion of, of the economy uh, and uh, economic, not just expansion, but also development. Um, and You've heard of all of these uh, uh, topics have been uh, lectured about um, uh, this week. Uh, Dr. Klein uh, gave a, a lecture on money uh, dealing with its purchasing power. Uh, and then um, on the first day, we also heard a lecture on uh, the division of labor and comparative advantage and um, oh, that's going to come later. But um, we heard, I think, Dr. Newman talking about business cycles already. And so this is going to be the third one. This is the third lecture in this uh, little macro series on the economics of prosperity. And there is uh, a significant literature that uh, Austrians have produced dealing with this uh, topic. Um, the roots of it can go back to, say, Bumbavirk and his positive theory of capital. Of course, Mises' human action uh, has a lot of material that um, can formulate a theory of economic prosperity. Uh, Mises wrote individual essays also on this topic. One, uh, The Plight of the Underdeveloped Nations, is an excellent uh, single essay on this topic. Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State, of course, speaks to this. Uh, David Osterfeld, who uh, is no longer with us, um, uh, passed away now, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, perhaps. Uh, he uh, wrote a book, Prosperity uh, versus Planning, published by Oxford University Press, which is an excellent discussion of this issue, written in, I think, 1992-93. Um, Jesus Witter de Soto, his Money, Bank, Credit, and Economic Cycles has a section talking about the process of economic expansion, and then he has also an excellent essay called Dynamic Efficiency which is uh, I, I draw upon in, in some of my work. Uh, Randy Holcomb, who has uh, spoken at many Mises Institute events and is the editor of uh, Great Austrian Economists, he wrote a book, Entrepreneurship and Economic Progress, which I also think is a very ex excellent, uh, excellent work, an extremely well-written book. And then uh, uh, Suda Shinoy, she was an Indian economist and really economic historian, uh, the Mises Institute publishes her doctoral dissertation towards a theoretical framework for British and international economic history, the early, mo uh, early modern England, a case study. And it really is a case study on how uh, the British economy developed. But the first part of that uh, provides um, a, um, a lot of good uh, economic theory related to uh, the issue of economic progress. And then finally, I want to mention Ben Powell's book, uh, Out of Poverty, which is also sort of like a case study of, of the economic contribution of sweat, sweatshops, so-called, um, and why would people voluntarily 
want to work in a, in a factory setting like that, but also in, it begins with a very good uh, theoretical uh, discussion about the nature of economic progress. So that's all literature that you would want to uh, look at um, if you're interested in this topic. I want to also want to mention one more person I didn't actually get on this list. Uh, as a, as a, a fairly young, uh, a younger scholar, a recent uh, fairly recent PhD uh, graduate, Victor Espinoza. Victor Espinoza has written a number of uh, important uh, articles on development that I also admire and draw upon as well. So with that uh, backdrop, let's talk a little bit about what is economic prosperity. Economic prosperity, we could say, is the result of economic expansion and development. And expansion and development are, are, are two Two slightly different things that can be that we can uh, distinguish between expansion simply means you know more goods per capita, right? So a, 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 an economy that, that is expanding uh, would be an uh, economy that allows us to have more food, or more clothing, or more shelter, or more you know smarty phones or whatever, right? Um, uh, that's economic expansion, more goods per person. Um, that would be the closest thing to what a lot of conventional economists called uh, economic growth, right? Economic growth. Um, now, uh, the other sort of facet of economic progress is uh, economic development. And development implies more than just more stuff. It means a greater variety of goods, right? Uh, a greater, uh, a better quality, right? So, for instance, the development of refrigeration. Development of refrigeration increases the quality and variety of foods we have available year round, right? Um, if, if you look at uh, cookbooks clear into say the 1950s and 60s, it was common to have dishes that were somewhat seasonal, right? Because there were certain goods that you, there were certain dishes that you could make only because the, say, the vegetables that you needed for this dish were only available a couple months a year, right? Well, with refrigeration, you have more foods, a greater variety of foods uh, year round. Automobiles uh, increase mobility, right? which significantly alters the, uh, the quality of life. Uh, books, newspapers, electronic media provide the opportunity to broaden our horizons, right? whether people take advantage of that opportunity to broaden their horizons or just deaden their minds, that's, you know, that's a decision they have to make. But um, the development of these things allows for um, a better quality of life. The, the, the medicine and better nutrition leads to longer, healthier lives. Uh, the tremendous uh, economic development is really the tremendous uh, variety of goods that provides a different quality of life, right? So taken together, economic expansion and development together makes up what we call economic progress, economic progress. So how do we get economic progress? Economic progress, first and foremost, requires increases in productivity, increases in productivity. Um, we know that in order to gain wealth, we have to produce wealth, right? And so we must be productive, we must engage in production, so we must apply labor to our land and our capital goods to produce products, but our labor is limited. So how do we increase both the quantity and quality of goods if we only have a certain amount of labor? Well, the way we do that is to increase the productivity of our labor. How can we get more goods and better quality goods from the same amount of labor? And that really, in large part, is what the economics of prosperity is all about. Now, to uh, understand the economics of prosperity, we need to recognize that this theory of economic prosperity requires both analysis and synthesis. Analysis and synthesis. Um, and it requires both analysis and synthesis because economic progress is an actual historical process. When uh, countries enjoy more economic prosperity over time, they do so in time, right? a moment in time. Uh, we are in a moment in time. And economic prosperity occurs across moments in time. 
And so it's a historical process, which means we have to be able to make sense of the historical process of development. And we begin by doing this uh, using analysis. Now, analysis is a scientific term that means breaking a complex substance into smaller parts to gain a better understanding of it, right? So uh, the process of economic progress is a, is, is, the, is a complex process that involves many different players, many different uh, vehicles, and to make sense of the contribution of these different players, if you will, we need to break them down and identify them. And this, I would say, is a place where a conventional mainstream economics is, um, is not wholly bad. Right? Uh, if you look at mainstream uh, growth economics, they do uh, a, 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 a somewhat okay job identifying certain factors that can lead to economic progress, things like capital accumulation and technology that we'll talk about more later. Right? But what they tend to miss Oh, well, let me back up the truck. Um, what have they identified? Economists in general, even, I have identified uh, the importance of capital accumulation, the importance of technological advance. Um, the Austrians rightly emphasize the market division of labor, the importance of the market division of labor. Um, and they emphasize wise entrepreneurship. Right? And so if we wanted to say what the, the four vehicles of economic progress, um, we could say the market division of labor, capital accumulation, uh, technological improvement or technological advance, and wise entrepreneurship. Those are the big four, and we're going to talk about those in, in, in some detail going forward. Um, and I would say the strongest contribution of the economic mainstream is identifying many of these uh, sources. But where they miss is understanding that this process requires, understanding the process of progress requires not just analysis, but synthesis. And synthesis is the composition or combination of parts or elements so as to form a whole. Um, and that's what synthesis is, putting all the different pieces of the puzzle together to form the, the whole picture of economic progress. So, for instance, we look at this a quotation uh, from uh, Eugen von Bumbavirk, quoted by Mises, and he says this, quote, a theory of the trade cycle, if it is not to be mere botching, can only be written as the last chapter or the last chapter but one of a treatise dealing with all economic prog uh, problems, end quote. Now, what he meant by this is that to understand economic business cycles, you need to understand a lot of other economic principles and see how these other economic laws all come into play to, expend, to explain the boom-bust cycle. Now that's, and, and I would argue what's true for understanding business cycles is also true for understanding economic progress, economic prosperity, economic expansion and development. Because a satisfactory theory of economic prosperity requires bringing together production theory, exchange theory, an understanding of the market division of labor, capital theory, the contributions of technology, how different institutional settings either hamper or encourage uh, the various sources of prosperity. Uh, it requires understanding entrepreneurial activity, entrepreneurship. And we need to know how all of these things work together to result in a process of economic progress. So we need to understand how all of these vehicles of prosperity work together comprising an economic order that fosters economic expansion and development. And then we need to understand the institutions that are necessary to nurture these vehicles, these sources of prosperity. And we have to understand what policies promote economic prosperity and which policies tend to hamper economic expansion and development. So what are these vehicles of prosperity? Vehicles, by the way, is a term that Mises used uh, to describe uh, some of these uh, factors that, that can lead to economic progress. Uh, the first is the division of labor. We've already had a lecture on the division of labor. The division of labor, we can define it as specialization of production according to efficiency. 
and uh, Mises famously uh, developed and exposited the law of association. He takes uh, David Ricardo's uh, law of comparative advantage that was applied mainly to um, nations and international trade, and he applies it to individual people. And he uh, notes that specializing according to efficiency and cooperative action is more efficient and productive than isolated action of so-called self-sufficient individuals. And therefore, as we participate in the market division of labor, as people are able to specialize in what they are uh, relatively better at producing, what they are the low-cost producer at producing, they are more productive. And as they engage in exchange, society, society is more productive. And as people in society engage in exchange, not only can we produce more, we can also consume more. So one of the great vehicles of economic progress is the market division of labor. And of these four, I must say, the market division of labor is almost completely ignored in modern growth theory. Modern growth theory has very little to say. There's hardly anything written. There is some, but hardly anything at all written. And that's, so this, that's, a, that's a big hole that, um, that uh, modern... Uh, neoclassical and, uh, well, conventional, neoclassical and or Keynesian growth theorists, sort of, that's a big hole in their theory. Uh, the second vehicle that we can talk about is saving and investment in capital accumulation, which we talked about some uh, yesterday. Capital, remember, is produced means of production, the tools, the machineries, the intermediate pro products that help us produce the goods we want to produce. And we talked about how the use of capital goods increased the productivity of the user. Right? And productivity simply means the greater uh, uh, the, the quantity of output per unit of land or labor. Right? That's what productivity is. So by increasing productivity, that means we are able to produce more with the same amount of land, the same amount of labor. Uh, for instance, in 1830, it is estimated that in 1830, it took the uh, average American farmer, 275 hours of uh, uh, man hours to produce 100 bushels of wheat. So uh, 275 hours of labor to produce 100 bushels of wheat. In 1987, it's estimated, it took three hours of labor to produce 100 bushels of wheat. Right. Now I want to say, well, that's, that's a significant increase in productivity. But the question is why? Is it because modern farmers work so much harder than farmers in, in 1830. Um, if we're talking to physical exertion, I would probably argue almost the opposite. I, I would venture to guess that the farmer, the average farmer in 1830, had to exert more physical effort to produce their crop. So if it's not an increase in physical effort, what is it? Well, it's capital. Right. The, the, the modern farmer has, 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 the modern farmer engages in much more capital intensive farming. They have tractors, they have plows, they have um, herbicide and pesticide apparatuses, uh, they have giant combines. Right? It's, 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 it's the, the difference between uh, f farming in, that, that, in the black and white photo there, the, well, it's not a photo, the, 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 the etching uh, basically by hand and some hand tools versus farming a large area with a combine. And, capital goods, right? So capital goods allow us to be a lot more productive. Now, of course, before they can be used, they must be produced, and that requires saving and investment. So in order to accumulate capital, people must be willing to put off present consumption so that they will have resources available to invest in the production of capital goods. And that is why a society with people who are relatively low time preference people, they that's a society where people are more willing to put off present consumption. They're more willing to save and invest. That, that, therefore, people in that society will tend to accumulate more capital goods, which will allow uh, for increased productivity. There'll be higher standards of living. People are able to obtain more and a larger variety of goods at lower prices, thereby allowing them to achieve more ends. Now, it's also interesting to note that in the natural course of events, it seems that with more capital investment often comes better technology. Because as people, say, replace an older tractor with a newer tractor, oftentimes the newer tractor has a little bit better technology. It embodies better technology. As you, as you, as you replace, say, the old mixer with the new mixer, it's a better technology. The old sewing machine with the new sewing machine, a better technology. Right? And so along with... Simply replacing old capital goods with new 
with capital maintenance and accumulation also becomes uh, better technology, which we'll talk about shortly. It's also important to note that as production patterns change to satisfy our preferences, in other words, if people become less present-oriented, so they, w they are willing to save more as, as, as a people, they will engage in economic progress because they'll accumulate more capital, but this economic progress is sustainable. It's not, it's, not, it's not the result of an inflationary boom that's unsustainable. If people save more to invest more, they will become more productive, but this pro and, and they will continue to be more productive as long as they continue to save. And this is not an inflationary boom. This increased investment is funded by voluntary savings. And so it is an investment pattern that actually reflects people's preferences, including their time preferences. So there's nothing contradictory. There's, there's no infla it doesn't lead to an inflationary boom that's going to resolve itself in a bust. It simply results in economic expansion and development. Now, it is interesting to note in contemporary uh, macroeconomics, even in saving and capital investment also is somewhat downplayed. Uh, they do, uh, a lot of contemporary conventional uh, macroeconomists will um, admit uh, that uh, investment in capital is a good thing, as Martha Stewart would say. Uh, incarceration, not a good thing. But, uh, you know, investment in capital formation, a good thing. But they're quick to say, look, there's diminishing returns to capital, so there's limits there. And so sustained economic expansion development can't come from savings. It has to be technology. Right, technology. So what can we say about, and, 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 and Austrians recognize that technology is important too. Uh, Mises identifies technological advance as one of the key vehicles of economic progress. So what can we say about technology? You may have seen this uh, photo before. Um, technology, when we talk about technology, it's important to understand what do we mean by technology. Technology is not machines. Technology is not just, say, you know, computers. Right? Technology really is simply the knowledge of how to do something. That's what technology is, a knowledge of how to do something. And technology, as a way of doing things, leads to prosperity as we discover better ways of doing things, ways that allow us to be more productive. And technology, can, technological advance, contributes to economic progress in, shall we say, three different ways. On the one hand, we have uh, the more productive capital goods, right? The difference between the technology in a hand whisk, uh, whisk versus the technology of the standing mixer, right? We talked about that some yesterday, that the stand-up mixer uh, has a more advanced technology that allows for eggs to get beaten by just pressing a button, or you know, actually not pressing a button, you have to move the, move the control a couple notches and it starts to go around. You can't do that with a whisk. You can't put a whisk in a bowl and say shazam and, and have the whisk start to, you know, move around like it's, you know, by itself, you know, kind of like uh, the sorcerer's apprentice in Fantasia or something. Uh, you can't do that, right? And so the, the stand-up mixer is, a, it, should we say, is a more technically advanced uh, form of mixer, right? And so that's one way technology, uh, technological advance increases our productivity. It allows us, it, it allows the capital goods to be more productive. But also, it's important to note that technology, technological advance can come in the form of a more productive arrangement of the production process. A more productive arrangement of the production process. Um, in some sense, that's really what Adam Smith was getting at when he talked about the, the pin factory. He, he was talking about how specialization of tasks within the production, and, and what's he really talking about there? What, what is, what was he describing when everybody does a particular task in the, in the production process in a factory? That's called assembly line production. And so assembly line production is one type of production technology. Uh, the main reason in many ways that Henry Ford uh, was so uh, productive in producing automobiles is that he applied assembly line production techniques to the automobile industry and allowed him to make a lot more cars per person, lowering costs so that he could then competitively lower prices to sell a lot more cars to a lot more people. 
And so here we have a, a picture of a Walmart. Walmart is actually somewhat um, famous in uh, management, in the management literature, for developing what they call the cross dock warehouse system, where uh, trucks would come in uh, from vendors, where you know, say with with with, with say truckloads of. Um, plastic um, uh, uh, plastic uh, bowls and plastic dishes and, and plastic uh, waste paper cans made by Rubbermaid. And then they pull them in, and instead of taking them off the, uh, off the truck and putting them in the shelves and letting them set for days and weeks and perhaps months, they created a warehouse system where they could take them off of the trucks from Rubbermaid and immediately put them on trucks across the warehouse, just a little bit, just like a, maybe an aisle across the warehouse, for all of these different trucks that are going to all their different stores, significantly cutting down the amount of time between when they get the, 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 the retail goods from the vendors, and then they can ship them out to their retail stores. And that great, significantly lowered uh, warehousing costs and allowed them to significantly reduce total cost of production of retail goods, which allowed them to offer you know, lower prices. And that's called the Walmart cross-docking system. And it was so successful that other stores tried to do, uh, you know, try to, try to do the similar thing. But the, the point is that production technology that aids in production can be in the form of a more productive arrangement of the production process. Um, a, a final way I want to talk about uh, how technology can lead to economic progress is uh, the improvement in consumer goods, right? Improvement in consumer goods. In my parents' lifetime, they went from having a crank phone in their house, which uh, I actually still have. This is one of the only family heirlooms. It, my, my, my parents gave me their parents' crank phone. It's the very same phone that my mom used to call my dad when he was in the military when they were, you know, soon after they got married. And, uh, and it was, it's, it's a crank crank and you have to hold the earpiece up like this. That was the level of telephone technology that they knew when they were children. When I was when I was a kid, uh, when I was a kid, uh, we had the, the phone that was in the middle, right? That was a big deal—a touch tone phone in the middle. That that thing, by the way, I don't know if you know this. That thing that's between the thing hanging up and the wall—that's called a cord. And all the phones used to have cords, right? It's like a, it's a, it's a historic relic now, but uh, that's what things were like. And so if you wanted privacy, you had to get a really long extension cord, right? So you could click in and then maybe you could go around the corner and talk to your friend, you know, uh, in, in, in so-called privacy or secrecy. Um, and just uh, you know, hope that nobody got on the other line. Um, uh, but in any event, of course, now it, the, 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 the smarty phone there is, is almost ubiquitous, right? Um, and so, uh, and, and of course, they can do a lot, that, that, that smarty phone can do a lot more things than just engage in telecommunications, right? And so there we have, uh, say, an improvement in consumer goods, or at least, again, it opens the door to uh, broadening your horizons, right? You can, you can also fry your brain on you know, a smarty phone if you want to. It's you know, value subjective. So anyway, uh, the simple point is that technological advance is also a vehicle that allows for economic progress. Right? So we have uh, the division of labor. We have capital accumulation. We have technological advance, three different vehicles uh, that promote economic progress by increasing our productivity. The final vehicle I want to talk about, however, is also one that tends to get downplayed in the growth literature. It is recognized in, in many areas of economics, but in the growth literature, mainstream growth is sort of downplayed, and that is what we call entrepreneurship. Uh, entrepreneurship is uh, important because economic progress takes place in a complex economic order. Um, you no doubt are aware that the market division of labor in which we live is very complex. It is, as the kids say, complicated. <laughs> uh, it is complicated. Uh, people specialize in very specific things, and for them to earn their income, there has to be a demand for their specific things. And the entire production structure we talked about yesterday is a very complex production structure, requires a lot of things happening at the right place at the right time for the right price. 
And so economic progress takes place in a complex economic order in which the sources of prosperity, the division of labor, capital accumulation, and technological advance must work together in an integrated fashion, right? And this is where the synthesis comes into play. Now, how does this happen? Well, they do work together be, as they are coordinated by entrepreneurs, which is why entrepreneurship is crucial to economic progress. Um, and this is something emphasized in a number of places. It's emphasized by Mises. It's also emphasized uh, by Huerta de Soto in his work, uh, Process of uh, 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 Dynamic Efficiency. He under, uh, uh, Huerta de Soto explains economic progress as a process of dynamic efficiency. It occurs to the extent, progress occurs to the extent, that production in the market division of labor capital accumulation, and technological advance work together for the purpose of increasing the quantity and quality of goods desired by and available to people so they can satisfy more of their ends. And all of this productive activity is coordinated by entrepreneurs who make a myriad of specific decisions regarding specific processes of production of specific goods at specific times in specific places. And so economic progress is enjoyed only as its sources develop together as an economic order. And this is precisely what does happen in a free society. Um, if you think about all of the production in the economic order requires entrepreneurial judgment. And that's why Mises calls the entrepreneur the driving force of production. Without the entrepreneur, the promoting entrepreneur, we would not have the same economic order. If we, if we, if we tried to substitute the economic order, the, 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 the entrepreneur, um, with, say, the central planning board or the economic czar, who it turns out is really not the economic czar. No, the economic czar, right, um, who's, who's trying to control and, and plan and make all of the economic uh, 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 decisions, you, you heard uh, yesterday that uh, that cannot happen because the central planning board or the economic czar does not have access to economic calculation because there's no market prices. And therefore, trying to enjoy sustainable economic progress without entrepreneurship is a, is a very dangerous prospect. It's, it's essentially doomed to failure. Now, why is this important? Why is this important? Right. Well, economic progress um, requires scarce factors to be directed to their most valued uses. And economic progress also occurs through innovation, which is the producing of new and different products in new and different ways. And so there has to be uh, entrepreneurial impetus for innovation as well. So all these things, on the, although that's like, in a sense that's the positive reason why entrepreneurship is important, we could also look at this from, this from a negative perspective. Entrepreneurship is important because waste of capital is possible, right? Let's suppose we save and we accumulate these ca this capital, but it's capital that's invested in unwise, unproductive projects, producing the, the I don't know, the, the anti zig a -zig ah, right? What people don't want, what they really, really don't want, right? <laughs> Uh, then, of course, th th that capital is not going to be used productively. Uh, those companies are going to earn losses. They're going to reap, um, uh, they could become insolvent. They could end up bankrupt, right? And so that's why, um, you know, waste of capital is possible. Because if production decisions in the present, production decisions are made in the present always based on a forecast of uncertain future market conditions. So there's never a case where if we just get more capital, we're guaranteed a profit, right? Uh, one of my favorite little phrases in all of human action is when Mises says, capital does not beget profit, right? Just having capital, you, you have to have capital to engage in production, but just having it doesn't guarantee that it's going to be used wisely, right? That is where the entrepreneur comes in. Because if a, if a producer forecasts incorrectly, he'll use his capital making something that people don't want. They'll not be able to sell their output at the price necessary to cover costs. They'll be losers. So the entrepreneurs need to use economic calculation if they are to coordinate their economic activity and their investments um, wisely. Right? By, so that they can direct factors of production toward their most highly valued uses. 
And economic uh, margin, economic judgments have many different margins. And as I was preparing this lecture, it reminded me of this, this passage in uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's last novel that he didn't actually finish. It's uh, called The Love of the Last Tycoon. And it's about the Hollywood, uh, uh, the, la the last tycoon, people basically understand that he was basing uh, The Last Tycoon on Irving Thalberg, who was sort of the boy, it wasn't really a boy, but the young genius at MGM, and was a film producer. And um, uh, Cecilia Brady is the, is the character who sort of narrates uh, the, the Love of the Last Tycoon, just like Nick is the, the guy who narrates um, uh, The Great Gatsby. Well, uh, Cecilia, uh, Cecilia Brady says this, quote, you can take Hollywood for granted like I did, or you can dismiss it with the contempt we reserve for what we don't understand. It can be understood too, but only dimly and in flashes. Not a half dozen men have ever been able to keep the whole equation of pictures in their heads. And uh, Cecilia Brady here was, was saying that, that um, the main character of The Love of the Last Tycoon, The Last Tycoon, the main character, patterned after Irving Thalberg from MGM, was one of those guys that was such a good film producer because he could see the whole thing in his head. In other words, he, he was responsible for making the myriad of decisions regarding producing films, and he had a knack of being able to see the big picture and also to make a number of sort of more uh, minute decisions in keeping with the big picture, and he was very successful at it. And so what are some of these decisions, right? What are some of these margins? Well, they include margins related to the product, right? What type of product should, it, should we produce? What, what quality of product should we produce? What, where should we produce the thing? Um, how large should our scale of operation be? Should we have a small shop, a larger factory, a gigantic factory, a multidimensional corporation? Um, when should our product be available? Should we produce it in the, 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 the shortest possible time completely? Or should we allow for a larger, I'd say a longer production process that might allow us to get a little more quality? Um, what, 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 what do we anticipate? Uh, what price do we anticipate buyers are willing to, willing to pay? Um, buyers are willing to pay. Those are all decisions that the producer has to make regarding to the product, right? Um, also, how are we going to market the product? How are we going to, what, what, what kind of marketing investment do we want to gauge in that's going to allow us to sell? And, and, and as we found this year, if, if you make a mistake on how you want to sell something, it can end up very badly. I mean, just ask, ask the people that make uh, Bud Light, for instance. You make, a, you, make a, you make an unwise choice about how to promote something, it, things could go bad for you. Um, uh, Coca-Cola did a very similar thing, again, back in the 80s when they went to, they went to, new, they went to new Coke, right? Uh, and they were going to get rid of the old Coke, but there was this backlash. And so they quickly, instead of just having Coke, now then they had new Coke and classic Coke, and then they sort of conveniently, sort of quietly, new Coke just sort of went away, and then it was just Coke again. Um, so those kind of decisions matter. Um, other margins include uh, capital investment, right? Uh, we talked about this a little bit uh, yesterday. Uh, how intensive should our production process be? How, how capital intensive should it be? Uh, how durable should the capital goods that we invest in be? How specific do we want our capital to be? How many capital goods do we want to have, right? Those are all decisions that have to be made by entrepreneurs that impinge on the success of the enterprise. Uh, in terms of technology, technology and the use of technology also requires um, entrepreneurial activity, entrepreneurial judgment. Um, what consumer goods characteristics do we want to have? What kind of smartphone? What do we want our smartphones to be able to do? What do people want the smartphones to be able to do? Uh, what production techniques do we want to do? What type of assembly line program do we want to have? Do we want to, do we, do we want to uh, have cross docking or not in our warehousing? Um, in terms of what, what, what characteristics of capital goods do we want to obtain? What do we want our capital goods to be able to do given their price? And finally, how much research and development do we want to invest in, if any? Right? Do, we, do we want to have it all done, uh, do we want to outsource it all, or do we want to do it in-house? Right? Those are all decisions that the entrepreneur has to make. That's a lot of entrepreneurial judgment. And for the, uh, the, 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 the economic order to be in order, these 
decisions by and large have to be wise decisions that help facilitate the coordination of the vast complex market uh, uh, division of labor, the vast complex production structure, so that consumer goods are uh, that people want are produced when they want, where they want, at prices that they're willing to pay. And it is here then that we see the importance of a proper synthesis. Right? We cannot neatly separate the vehicles of economic progress from one another and find like the single vehicle, the single source that, that, that explains the whole thing. For instance, a highly developed division of labor would be impossible without the accumulation and use of capital goods. Right? To be able to specialize in a task means you have to have the capital goods suitable for that task. Likewise, the entrepreneur is not just you know, floating out in the space making decisions about future production. Right? No, the entrepreneur must... To be productive, the entrepreneur has to have actual capital. He invests real capital and directs real scarce capital goods in the production process. At the same time, as I've already mentioned, capital per se never guarantees economic progress either because it has to be widely utilized by the entrepreneur. And for technology to be productive, for, for technology to be useful, it has to be bound up in an actual capital good, which requires investment, right? Just, just knowing that... It, a stand-up mixer is more productive than my whisk. It might be, you know, interesting, an interesting bit of trivia, but it doesn't help me produce anything if I don't have the mixer, right? So I need the knowledge bound up and embodied in actual capital goods. So for someone to benefit from technology, it is not merely enough to know that the machine exists. It must be possessed. And so without capital investment, Technology is of no use. The knowledge of how to do something is of no use if we don't have capital investment. But with capital investment, technology will advance as entrepreneurs continually to seek to use uh, better and better capital goods. And of course, technology also must be utilized economically. Right? Now, there are certain technologies that, that this is something, again, that... Um, uh, Patrick Newman emphasized, right? We could, we, we, the, the, the engineers can tell us what are the physically more productive tools or ways to do things, but they may not be economically productive, right? The, the, the most productive, technically productive way to do things may be too expensive for us, and if we devote all of our resources to get that one thing, we may not have enough resources to complement that one thing, and so we actually can't produce the product, we can't bring it to fruition. Right? So economic progress is a process of dynamic efficiency. It is the happy consequence of an expanding, highly developed division of labor taking advantage of an increasing capital structure embodying better technology wisely invested by entrepreneurs. That is the process of economic progress. Um, now, understanding that process also helps us to understand what, what limits the process. What limits are there to uh, economic progress? And we've, uh, we've already seen that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. Right? So there is a constraint on how complex and extensive the division of labor is. Right? Because it will only benefit to specialize in production of something for which there is a market. Right? If, uh, if, 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 if there's no, if, if I want to, I want to specialize in rocket science, but nobody demands rocket science, even though I like rocket science, it's going to have to be a hobby. I can't specialize in it because I can't trade it for income. And so the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, which means without trade, we must produce everything we consume ourselves. And exchange requires private property. You can't trade what you don't own. So in order to take advantage of the division of labor, society must have, must embrace and defend the social institution of private property. Another limiting uh, aspect in economic progress is the extent of saving and investment. Right? It's saving and investment in specific tools and machinery that allows for more specialized production and uh, increased productivity. So a reduction in saving and investment would limit the division of labor and would limit the stock of capital goods. And so in those societies that are relatively high time preference where they don't save very much, they will tend to have lower standards of living. 
Those societies that are willing to save and invest will, able, will be able to enjoy uh, higher standards of living because they'll save and invest, they'll have more capital accumulation, they'll have a more extensive market division of labor, and uh, they'll be more productive. Uh, finally, we could say one limit to economic progress is simply the challenge of production for the market. Right? If, if we're in, engaging in direct use production, we're producing just for ourselves, it's a relatively simple process in the sense that we know what we want. Right? You know, I know what I want, and, I, and, I, and I'll produce according to, to get it. But in the market, who are we producing for? We're producing for other people. And so that's where the possibility of economic waste comes into play. Right? Producers don't know exactly what other people want. And so they must, they must make objective production decisions about future subjective preferences of other people. And that, again, is why economic calculation that uh, Patrick Newman talked about yesterday is so important. Right? We have to have a society that allows for actual free market prices and monetary prices. Well, what kind of uh, society allows that to happen? A society where there is private property. Right? And so it turns out that in order for us to enjoy the, an economic order where the market division of labor and capital accumulation and technological advance and wise entrepreneurship can take place and flourish and thereby formulate an economic order, in order to be able to enjoy that, we must have a society that embraces the institutions of the free society, namely private property that allows for voluntary exchange, the development for money, monetary prices that are meaningful. It allows for people to save and invest in capital formation and direct capital as they see fit so that our productivity is increased and ultimately we will be able to enjoy more and better goods that we can use to satisfy more of our ends. Thank you.